Welcome, welcome to the Sharp Way. It is uh, Wednesday night, is that right? I'm uh, With the lockdown, I'm scared. I don't remember what night it is, but I believe it's Wednesday night. Um, we are here yet again, 7 p.m., trying to give you something exciting, interesting, new, showing you what's going on in the world today. Um, and look, if you like what we're doing, do me a favor, like, comment, share, get other people to see what we got going on. Uh, tonight, right now, we have a guest. Yes, I am so happy that we actually have a guest today. That guest is someone from my old neighborhood. Yes, from the Bronx. Uh, someone who is running right now for New York City Council and the founder of Build the Bronx, Uniqua Smith. Thank you for coming today. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. Absolutely. Very happy to have you. Um, Look, you are... You're from my own neighborhood, right? We, we both, we're both both from the Bronx. I love the Bronx, but I had a lot of trouble connecting with the Bronx. I think maybe I've been gone too long, right? I haven't lived in the Bronx in since late 70s. It's been a long time since I've actually been living in the Bronx. I go through every once in a while, but it's rare. I haven't lived there in a long time. I really wanted to be closer and connect. You're obviously connecting. Why did you decide to run now, right, for a 2021 seat? And then why city council? There are so many other things you could be doing. Why city council? Why now? So why now? Um, this is, we're in, living in pivotal times outside of um, just the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the 2021 New York City administration is going to look very, very different. So for between 2020 and 2021, approximately 59% of the elected official seats in New York City will be, um, they, they will be ch changing hands. Um, mm, okay. So changing of the guards. Um, so in 2021, um, there will be quite a few city council seats that um, candidates will be term limiting out on. Um, I am currently a part of an initiative called 21 and 21, where I'm a community organizer um, mm -hmm. to help to get, um, to, for, um, for, to help to get 21 females, uh, female representatives into city council um, in 2021. Um, Hold on, this is that a lot of people may not know. Are there not many females in the New York on New York City Council? So currently, we have five uh, female councilwomen. Out of 51. Um, yes, and in 2021, if we were to have 21 elected uh, females elected to women elected to city council, we would have 26 women that would give us the majority. So there's a there's a huge gender disparity there. Um, well, and you would think that New York City would be better when it came to the gender issue, right? You would think us being a progressive city that we would have uh, a better mix of gender in our city, but at, at surprising that's not the case. Absolutely. So. Um, you asked why city council, um, and that that kind of ties in with um, a little bit of my my why story on on why it is that I decided to run um, all together. So uh, back in October, uh, late September, early October of last year, um, my my children. I'm I'm a mom of twin boys. Um, mm -hmm. They turned 13, but they were 12 years old, and they were robbed on a New York City bus. They were robbed on oh my the god bus in the Bronx. Yes, and. Um, Basically, I've always been very active in the community. I've attended nearly uh, nearly all of the community board five meetings in my in my community. Um, but when my children were robbed, it was very ironic because just a week prior, I had just attended a community board meeting where we got into a very hot and heavy debate over whether or not there should be more cameras within our district. Um, so I don't know if you're. Um, I'm, Pretty sure your audience is very well educated and they probably attend their own community board meetings. But when you sit in a general board meeting, um, all of the changes that are that you're hearing about are changes that have already been voted on, that have already mm. taken place. Sure. Um, and you're just there to monitor and to hear what's what changes are taking place in the community. You don't really have much of a say so. Even if there's something that's um, let's say there's an issue that's that's up for debate and it's the council members who then go to meet and the community board members who then go to meet in private and then have their opportunity to vote. Um, as you know, as a general body, as a constituent, you don't really have a say so. So um, while I was sitting in the meeting, a lot of people spoke about why it is that they felt that there should be more cameras in the district, why mm -hmm. there shouldn't be. And I was I was very torn. And when my children got robbed, the first thing that I thought of was, uh, well, where's the cameras on the bus? Sure. And um, once the 
once the detectives got involved, the first thing that they told me was, okay, we're going to try and see if we can, you know, pull up the camera footage on the bus. And then the detective calls me back and says, well, you know, in all actuality, I, we spoke with the MTA. There was no working bus, um, no cameras on the bus at that time. So we don't have the opportunity to pinpoint, you know, anyone who, who could be a suspect. So, uh, so hold on, I'm going to be clear. So do you feel, and this is a very, uh, 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 New, York, New York City has tons of cameras. It's a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal, a lot of cameras, and a lot of people are against the cameras. I, I'm not a big fan of, of cameras. I, I don't like the surveillance state at all. I can't stand it. But but my 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 piece is if there was a camera on the bus, do you think that your your kids might not have been robbed? Do you think they that it would have changed or shifted or adjusted what happened? Well, everyone everyone dislikes the um, surveillance until you're sure. in a situation where you're like, where were the cameras? Mm -hmm. So. Um, <laughs> um, sure. The problem with the situation with my children were that um, the, the the person who robbed them was sitting behind them, and ah. they told me that they 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 remember seeing this guy behind them um, and the, um, the the two seaters that are kind of facing mm -hmm. this way. But they remember seeing the guy, but he had on a hood, sitting with him, and they never really bothered to to you know get a description of what his face looked like because they couldn't you know say okay, well I'm going to be robbed in ten minutes from now. Let me get a good look at this guy's face. Of course. And the aftermath. And they were of, kids, right? So they're not thinking that they were kids. Exactly, they were twelve years old. So, right. um, and the aftermath of it, uh, the detectives called them in to pick out, uh, pick pick the suspect out of a photo array, and they kept saying, "Well, I don't know what the guy looks like. You can show me a million photos, but I don't, I wouldn't be able to identify who that is." So I said, um, "You know, at this point, the cameras would have been very helpful." Mm -hmm. And the detective told me that. On a lot of the buses that run through that line that runs through my district, they don't have working cameras, and that's the problem. So, um, so hold on. I so there, there was a camera there, but the camera wasn't working. Is that what I'm getting at? Well, they did not tell me if there was a camera there and it was not working. They just said that there was no working camera on that bus. I don't know if there was a camera and it just stopped working or whatever the case may be, but. Um, uh, that prompted me to get in contact with my assemblywoman and my councilwoman mm -hmm. and um, to try and be, because it, it was very important to me that my children felt that they were protected. When you oh, send your sure. kids mm -hmm. out of the home and they're traveling by themselves, so parent, you know, I felt like I wasn't there to protect them, mm -hmm. you know, and I want them to feel empowered to continue to be able to travel in public on their you own. You want them to be um, on their so own. You want them Instead to of just sitting by and saying, okay, well, and I want them to feel safe, and I want them to know that as a parent, I even though I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a helicopter mom and mm -hmm. hover over you every which way. I want you to know that if something does happen to you, we have a voice and we have the ability to make a change in the community. We don't have to just take what happens to us. We Absolutely. can be the change that we wish to see in the world. So um, through that, I entered the participatory budgeting. Um, the participatory budgeting process. And I reached out to Councilwoman Gibson's office. Um, her office was very, um, very timely and they responded very quickly about walking me through how to enter the participatory budgeting process. And so you I are really involved I in, in your local community. I love this. This is great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I entered and I, I requested to have $250,000 allocated to um, towards putting working cameras on the buses and that on that line that runs through my district, which is the 40 and 42 mm -hmm. bus. So unfortunately, due to COVID-19, the participatory budgeting um, process has been canceled for this for this sure. year. But I spoke with Councilwoman Gibson afterwards and she said that she still does have the ability to allocate those funds even though the participatory budgeting process has been canceled, she still has that money within the budget. So that's something that we're still currently working on getting that, that money allocated so to the world. Let me now go to the piece you just brought up, right? I'm glad you're so concerned to your local community, it's great. So that money may wind up going away after COVID, who knows, right? Who knows if they're gonna say, you know, we don't have it anymore or it's gotta go to this or it's gotta go to that, who knows? With that in mind, do you have uh, an opinion on how well the the city has handled COVID? And and if you do or don't, do you have an opinion on de Blasio, good or bad or anything in between? Well, <laughs> to be honest, I am. Um... 
I get a lot of, I, I catch a lot of backlash because my kids and I actually went out and we canvassed for de Blasio in his second term for mm -hmm. mayor. Um, I, I, I enjoy a lot of New Yorker, a lot of New York City voted for him. He's, he's, he's a, a two term mayor. Yep. He, he definitely had a good story with um, the, the, the tale of two cities um, and getting the universal pre-K uh, initiative started. And he's, mm -hmm. he, he did, he did stick to his word on that. So, um, so that was something that I felt very, very strongly about because, again, raising children, you see how the cost of childcare and mm -hmm. trying to, to send your kids through um, into a daycare while you go to work and they're three and four years old and trying to get back to work, trying to get back to pick up your children within the hour. Otherwise, you're going to start to get charged ten dollars per minute after after the daycare hours so that was something different but um as far as the the response um i'm not really much of a a critic of the of our elected officials because one thing that i can say is um elected officials hear our complaints day in and day out people go up to elected officials all day long and say you know there's so many different problems in the community but yeah. not many people are willing to offer the solution sure Elected officials are completely bombarded um, with having to use brain power and, and, and decision fatigue is, is, is really a, a real thing. And now that I'm involved in this campaign, I understand what it means to not be able to just wrap your head around a million different things all at one time. And um, what I can say is I think that anyone who sits in who sits in office, I can't say any and everyone, but most people who are in office currently are trying the best that they can. Um, they're not in, I don't think that anyone goes through an entire campaign process, um, has to face the ridicule of being an elected official just for personal gain. You, th there's a lot of, what about the, the critique? And if you don't want to bring it up, I don't have a problem if you don't want to bring it up, but there is a critique on him, which is he's heavy handed, right? That it's, he decides and he knows better. And that's the answer. Is that something you're okay with? You don't want to comment on it. I know if, if you're part of his campaign, I don't want to put you in a bad spot. You don't have to, you don't have to answer. But that, that is a critique that people often give him. They go, he thinks he knows everything. He's always making decisions for us. He's always deciding. We don't want this. He just does this. We hear it all the time. I can't say that. One, I haven't heard that. And two, I can't really say that. Um, I can't say that I side with that, that he mm -hmm. that he um, is very heavy handed. Um for the most part, I feel, if anything, I feel bad for Mayor de Blasio because he catches a lot of backlash from mm -hmm. the police department. Um, when I witnessed the police department turn their back on him at the funeral a few years back, uh, you know. Yeah, cops I, don't I, like him. Yeah, you know, like I said, as an elected official, it's it's, it's pretty difficult to, to appease both sides on, on everything, because if he sided with the police department, then he loses the trust and the loyalty of the constituents who will say, OK, well, what about the aggressive policing? And, Absolutely. And during that time, that was that was a very hot button issue um, during the time when the two officers were um, unfortunately killed. Rest in peace. But um, mm -hmm. that, that was a very hot button issue. And de Blasio made a few what I believe to be innocent comments and and it just spiraled out of control. Right. He lost the entire respect of the department. Um, as far as his handling of COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, I really don't, I can't say that I can see a way for him to have handled it better. You see mm -hmm. what happened when he tried to close the schools for the rest of the year. It turned into a little bit of a, a cat fight between the I black and Governor Cuomo. So, um, so I don't think that, I don't think that there was anything that he could have done differently, but a, Again, he does have an entire staff. Someone could uh, he could have had someone else research on ways to handle it better. Um, but it's always it's always easy to formulate an opinion. But once you're in the hot seat, it's like, what are you going to do? What are you, what are what are the solutions that you would have implemented? And I can't say that I have those solutions. I'm not I'm not in the mayor's position right now, and I have a lot of other things that I have to focus on with my campaign. So um, I I can't say that I see any shortcomings in the way that he's dealt with it okay. right now. Okay. The, so so let me go to now with COVID, right? I know that you were talking about what your issues were prior. Now we have a COVID problem, right? And it's going to be ending whenever it ends here. Um, have your issues or things that matter to you, has, has the COVID-19 crisis changed? Ha, are you now thinking differently or the same? Absolutely. So it definitely did. Um, so I'm definitely thinking a lot differently due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I have uh, more of a focus on trying to be an asset to 
our our healthcare community. Mm -hmm. um, one of my goals is to reach out to some of the um, some of the unions around that that work with our healthcare industry and trying to find out what it is that they need. Um, I see a lot of elected officials in the Bronx are now focusing on getting groceries to um, constituents because that's a real problem. You see lines lines wrapping around the block for supermarkets and um, at the donations. Well, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of serious um, I would say almost you know, good food deserts in the Bronx where it's hard to get good food. Absolutely. And I'm living in one currently. So that's definitely a part of my platform. Um, but that goes into, so because of, because of that, um, you know, I have my nonprofit organization, Build the Bronx. Build the Bronx. And, yes. Yes. So we, there are tons of different, there, there are seven different issues that we, ta that we focus on, but for the most part right now, we've kind of, put everything else on pause to try and be able to deliver PPEs. And I don't know if you can kind of see behind me, but- I do, that's your district. <laughs> well, not just my district, on that table there, we have some donations that of PPEs to go out to some of the senior centers that we have here in the Bronx. Um, I was on a community board five meeting a few days ago, and after the after the community board five meeting, um, an assemblyman reached out to my community organizer over at Build the Bronx and let us know that um, the the community center on da at Davison Community Center had no PPEs. Mm. And they were they're now outside of the fact that they house a, a, a rehabilitation facility. They uh, provide meals for seniors in the, the building, but they are now doubling as a COVID-19 testing facility mm -hmm. and they have no PPEs. So we actually use our, our own money to be able to provide uh, masks, gloves, hand sanitizer to the community center. And we reached out to some other community-based organizations and we were able to- So build the Bronx was actually able to support local community. Yes, we reached nice. out, we got some donations. We we have snacks, we have masks, we have cloth masks, surgical masks, mm -hmm. um, medical, uh, medical grade um, exam gloves. And um, we have a ton of different things that we're, we're um, donating. We have care packages for our healthcare workers. We have slippers to go to mm -hmm. um, residents of senior centers and things like that. So um, outside of just campaigning, we've been making sure that we're being an asset to the community. And, and trying as best as we can to, I'm not a healthcare worker, sure. so I can go out and, and do testing, but um, it, we're, we're trying to be an asset as, as best as well, we can. I, I feel like what you're telling me, and please tell me if I'm wrong here, I feel like what you're telling me is your nonprofit is actually doing some pretty good work here. Um, even though you're not, you're not a doctor or medical personnel, obviously that's not, what you, that's not your job, but you've been able to support those who have. Um, I love the idea of being part of the community. I love the idea of, of going out and doing that. I, I have myself gone out and 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 not last weekend. For some reason, people didn't ask me last weekend, but people will ask me sometimes. I have a car. And as you know, in New York City, not everybody has a car. Absolutely. So, right. So if you ha I happen to have a car, so I'm able to drive it and drop people, uh, drop off um, stuff for people who need things, right? I mask up and, and glove up and I, I just drop off the door and leave, right? So I don't want to, you know, uh, interact with them. I don't have to. Um, I think that there's a lot of value. Uh, and my piece, which I think is I, I'm concerned about, is I think that people who are doing what you're doing, the Build the Bronx and things like that, I feel like you can be m more effective as a, hopefully you win, I hope you win, assuming you win, supporting the Build the Bronxes of the city more than actually creating policies that would help people directly. I would bet Bill the Bronx knows better than the New York City Council. Do you think I'm wrong with that? I'm okay if you do. Huh. No, so I think you bring up a very interesting point. And people, um, so a lot of people don't necessarily understand the relationship between nonprofit organizations and our elected officials. Our elected officials rely very heavily on nonprofit organizations. So mm -hmm. um, one person that I can say I, I, I look up to is my councilwoman, Vanessa Gibson. She does a very great job of partnering up with a lot of nonprofit organizations to be able to, uh, to, to build the outreach of the organization. So as an elected official, you hear these problems day in, Day out, and the first thing that comes to mind is okay, what nonprofit organization is it that I can connect them to 
um, th this constituent to to be able to help them solve this problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you come up with a solution, that's great. If you have a solution in mind and I have a nonprofit in mind, then I can directly connect you and, right. and hopefully that will solve that problem. Otherwise, um, then then I can get, you know, if I have a staff, I can get my staff to work on saying, OK, well, here's a problem. What solution can we come up with? But right now I have 30,000 other problems that I have to deal with. Let's let's figure out how we can capacity build to the best of our ability and and, and be able to resolve some of the problems that, that um, the community is currently facing. Um, yeah, I, I, lo I love that. I, I know that I see it very often. Right. I was always saying that if um, you know that I ran for governor in 2018 yes. and if I had won, the first thing I would have done is I would have tried right during this time. I would have tried my best to assist and kind of give a push to, to the local nonprofits to jump on board right away. I mean, you said it. You were out there giving out hand sanitizer, PPE. I wish we had begun that process about three months earlier. Right. That. Three months earlier, organizations like yours, Build the Bronx, would have been in the forefront right away, right? Would have been the key and the center. I like the idea that we have the the, the 911 or the 311 as a center hub for information. I love that part tremendously. And I, I wish we had linked uh, our nonprofits better to that. That makes any sense, right? We could have gone there and we would have a direct link to each one. I think would have been better if we had started that way. I feel that we went to centralized control and we let the local, we let the local people, we, we, we handcuffed them. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to act. They were waiting for someone above to go do stuff. And they went, should we, should we, uh, that, that I think is the biggest issue. So I can agree with that. And one thing, one reason why I feel that I'll be, I'll, I'll do very well in the role of city council is because my background is in business. I've, I've mm. owned, I've owned, I've owned the tax office in the Bronx on East Tremont and Daly. Um, sure. Yes. So I've owned the tax office. I, I, I know quite a bit about um, running a business. And when you think about allocating funds and things like that, you need someone who is proficient in managing that that and managing a business and, and right. making sure that the funds are going to the right place. And one thing that I um, one one thing that I think that I do well at is running a very lean operation. Mm -hmm. And when you run a lean business, the 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 primary the the central idea behind running a lean business is that before you go out and offer a solution to anything, you have to receive feedback on on who that you are servicing on right. what the solution should be. So instead of just going out and offering and saying, okay, well, we're in the midst of this pandemic, I think that this community needs groceries, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can I can go ahead and start giving out groceries because maybe that's a little bit of a common sense thing. You've got children at home and you know they're eating a lot more than normal. And maybe these the parents in the community need the groceries, but once you offer a solution, then you have to get the feedback of the community and say, is this still what you need? Is this right. working properly for right. you? And then if they say, okay, well, you, you're you bombarding us with groceries. Our pantries are full. We don't need any more groceries. What we really need is PPE. Mm -hmm. Then then you go out and you, you start get, getting donations for PPE and things like that. And that's what uh, Bill the Bronx is currently focusing on. So um, so that's, that's pretty much my platform. I want to be lean and I want to make sure that I'm I'm doing the research and I'm connecting directly with the constituents. I'm connecting directly with the nonprofit organizations to find mm -hmm. out where the shortcomings are, where it is that they need assistance. And, and that that's pretty much it. I like it. I like it. So what I'm hearing is you want to run lean, but look, if you, if you look at what has happened often, um, particularly in New York state as a whole, New York city specifically, but New York city as a whole, we haven't run lean at all, right? We've had, Massive deficits, massive debt. I think before before the COVID crisis, we had about four hundred billion dollars in debt. We had about a six billion dollar budget uh, uh, shortfall deficit. Now we're looking at sixteen billion dollars in a deficit. New York City will be at least half of that, right? Generally speaking, New York City is about half of New York State's budget. About so New York City will probably be about I don't know eight billion dollar deficit. It hasn't happened. How can someone like you? want to run lean when everyone's going to be like, give me more money, right? We need more money. We're behind. I think it's refreshing that you want to run lean. Do you see the, the problem that people are going to have? Yes. So um, 
So my solution to that problem would be that for each of the seven uh, issues of my platform that I plan on tackling, I will have someone that is directly in charge of researching and staying in contact with the nonprofit for each one of those issues. And, and forming, so basically the, the, the solution to that is forming, forming partnerships that are, that are reliable and making sure that you're doing a good assessment of the partnerships that you, that you have with these different nonprofit organizations. So, um, for example, um, I don't want to call out any nonprofit organization specifically and say that I don't think that they're doing that they're doing well. But there's a lot of different nonprofit organizations that we give our funding to that just aren't necessarily reaching the constituency that the way that we should see them. It's mm -hmm. very there's a lot of barriers to receiving the help. So there's um, there's a few nonprofits in mind that I can think of that um, some of the people in the building have complained about that. For example, when they, they have eviction issues and they need to try and get assistance with evictions, they have to, they can do walk-ins on Tuesday and Thursday. And you have to, even though they don't open until 9 a.m., you have to line up at 8.30 because they're only accepting the first 10 people. But these nonprofits are, they have a huge allocation of our budget. And it's like, well, what are you doing with this? And that, right. and, and I think that the solution well, to that is to do a lot of research is there value, and I brought this idea up in the past, and please let me know if you feel this is valuable or not. Is there value in taking the nonprofit model and using a sponsorship model, right? So as an example, we have a, um, a nonprofit that's going to be delivering food. I'm making this up for sake of argument, right? Delivers food. Um, is there value in making it, you know, it is a food delivery nonprofit, but it's sponsored by Kellogg's or something like that, right? So Kellogg now has a sponsorship. Similar in a way, this may be a, a bad example, but similar in a way to um, schools are sometimes sponsored by, by companies that give free food and things of that sort. Do you think that model is a valuable model as a way to make a, a smaller budget so we run leaner and then allowing some marketing from some organization that gets basically marketing value from sponsoring it, and then maybe even a discount on the food that this would deliver, but it would take kind of the, the only thing that would be involved as long as they were following whatever were the government rules and regulations in panning out the food. Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that we should make that. I, I understand where it is that you're coming from with that. Yeah. And like I said, um, our councilwoman, Vanessa Gibson, she does something similar. She does, um, right? Okay. Yes. So right now she, so for example, in my building, I don't know if you can see on the paper behind me, but I volunteer for some of the, um, so for some of the um, grocery uh, distribution mm. that she does as well. Not directly with her. I'm not endorsed. I'm not backed by sure. anyone in the, <laughs> that's in any, any elected officials as of currently, but um, I do volunteer because this is my neighborhood. So when sure. she does come out and she does a uh, food distribution, I know that um, she did for the past four Mondays, the food, the grocery distribution has been um, sponsored by Fresh Direct. They, so Fresh oh, Direct. Oh, I see. Very nice. Yes. So they've done three or 400 boxes of groceries each and every Monday. And she's come to the building and distributed um, in, in conjunction with Fresh Direct. Now there's another organization that's also giving us hot prepared food and that's called Eat Clean Bro. And the, the, tomorrow we'll be distributing again. So for Fresh Direct, uh, we'll be deliver, we'll be distributing, I, I believe it's gonna be another 300 boxes of uh, Fresh Direct groceries in conjunction with New York Common Pantry, as well as um, Eat Clean Bros, who does the hot prepared food and it's delicious, by the way. Um, and <laughs> I like that, good plug, good plug. <laughs> healthy, healthy, I mean, I'm, I don't work with any of them in particular, but it's just amazing to see that there are organizations who are willing to to help out during this pandemic. They, I, they're not being paid for this. They're not receiving no. any kickback on doing this. It's just, I guess the only thing that they would receive back is, you know, the marketing, having their name out there. And if, if that's all that they require in order to be able to help out this, this community, which is, you know, number three in homelessness out of uh, nine districts in the Bronx. And that's, Bronx that's and great. So, yeah. um, so I would do, you know, I, I, I would so, speak. So, so you've already, you know, if, if I understand correctly, and, and maybe I'm giving you a little bit of hint for your campaign, I don't know, but um, you know, if, if you already have these relationships, if you can retain them after COVID, 
to keep these nonprofits being funded. So there's still so there's going to be a need in the Bronx, even after COVID, right? Poverty doesn't go away, right? Because COVID goes away. There are still gonna be people who need help, still gonna be kids who need help, still gonna be, you know, people who need treatment that's still gonna exist, right? So if you can keep these these when the budgets get cut and they're gonna get cut, Cuomo's already talking about it, right? The budget's gonna get cut. He talked about, you know, taking money away from schools already. That is going to happen, right? This is going to be an economic downturn like we've never seen. If we don't have businesses who are also trying to grow and, and you know, and, and hire people and grow, if we can't use those businesses to support these nonprofits, I don't know who is, right? I don't, I don't know where that money is going to come from. And if we could, someone like you who could maybe be, be, be a voice, to say, look, I want you to help. And by the way, when you have drivers and delivery people, you should hire some Bronx people, right? You should hire some Bronx people to do it and maybe even put a, a hub in Sobro, maybe even put a hub in South Bronx so that you know we could deliver. I think that might be something that would be a way for you to still run lean, deal with the surely uh, shorten budget and still be able to service people who are still going to need that help after this is over. Absolutely. And I think that that's where one of my strengths lies because um, again, well, I don't know, you, you may not know, but I am not, I'm not here um, through anyone necessarily within, uh, within government currently just, placing me and saying, okay, well, I choose this person to be my successor or anything like that. So I'm very grassroots. Um, mm -hmm. My organization is grassroots organizing. A lot of the donations that we received have been from, um, from just regular folk. It's not, it's not oh. a conjunction with any type of organization necessarily, but we reach out and we, that's what community organizing is all about. It's you have resources. There's a need over here. Mm -hmm. How can we, you know, cause that to mesh. Just two days ago, I had to drive all the way out to the southern tip of Long Island to be able to grab face shields. Um, mm. when, and I want to be able. I want to. I want to say this. This organization's name. It is called Print the Curve. Um, okay. They donated sixty face shields. And um, Alexis, would you mind handing me the face shields so I can show? But they're on the table right there. The, the yellow ones. But they're. Um, they donated 60 face shields and ear savers to nice. the organization. So ear savers are basically where you, um, if you wear the mask all day behind your ears begin to hurt a little bit. So oh, sure. Ear savers on to help you. So these print the curve and I'm print the, I'm print the curve basically donated these face shields, which you, you put on that way. The rubber band goes behind to connect um, to help it extend. But basically this is, this is that's also a, a grassroots movement as well. Basically, what he did is he has a 3D printer and he printed these out. So he said, you know, he saw he answered the call that I had on my Facebook page saying, listen, if you have anything that you're willing to donate, please let me know. We need PPE right. for the community centers in the Bronx, um, the senior centers. And they answered the call. They said, okay, well, we have these these masks. Is anyone is anyone willing to? I love this. <laughs> so I so do. All about community organizing. That's how you organize the community. It's grassroots. It's not. It's just. It's not always just relying on organizations or or requiring government to intervene on everything. The community will answer the call if you have a call to action. You just. I agree completely. Yes. Action. Absolutely. I think the community, you know, I think a lot of people believed that the community wouldn't step up in this, but I think it has. I think neighbors have stepped up and New York City's tough, as you know, and a lot of people in the city, you know, some people have lived in the city all their life. You know, I lived in the city most of my life, but a lot of people haven't, right? They, they come in, they leave, they, they've been here for a little bit, they go away, they move around. So it's harder for us to have that tight knit community than many other areas. But even with that, I think we have, I think we've still made, even though it's been harder for many people in the city, but I think we have done it. I think a lot of New York, and I think we saw it even during the blackout when the blackout happened. I think we oh. saw it. Yeah. We, we see it often, right? The city does, people do step up when someone motivates them. And one of the reasons why I'm so happy you came on our show is, is because you're that combination. You're someone running for office, but also you run a nonprofit. So you see how the community, you're, 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 you're about bottom up, right? 
what what do the people on the ground need? How, how do they actually work, right? And then how, do, how are we able to, to motivate them? What I would hope that I could give you a little bit of a, a nudge on is I think you can get someone like you who speaks as well as you do about these issues. It's clear you care, right? It's clear that you care and you have a business background. I think you grab a couple of um, of, uh, uh, of of corporate sponsors, you knock it out of the park. I think it's there. Just well, my opinion. Thank you. So this is actually your show is actually my official soft release on my campaign. Um, so I've been I've been doing work in the community. I I, I was born and raised in community um, and city council district sixteen. Mm. I I I've lived here all of my life. I have li literally moved from one building on the corner to the building now in the middle of the block. So that's about as far as I've moved. So I I, I was born, raised, and educated in this district. Um, now I'm raising my children in this district, so I know about some of the shortcomings, which yep. is the schools. We yep. have um, we a lot of the schools in my district are currently failing. So one of the things that I'm looking to tackle is forming relationships with some of the the principals and the and the faculty and, and staff at the at the local public schools here to find out well what resources is it that you need what what is it how can we be uh, you know an asset to you what is it that you're looking for from your city council members. Um, that you uh, are private schools doing better in your area or no private schools i can't say that they're doing any better to be honest with you um my at first at first my children went to school in harlem went to a charter school in harlem but then you know i had to be very introspective and i said well why would you send your children to school in harlem instead of bettering the community that you're currently in i love and, that so it was okay well instead of me sending them somewhere else or me deciding to move somewhere else i need to be the change in the community because there are my building has 384 units in it so not everyone has the opportunity to sit there and take their children back and forth to school in harlem every day or whatever the case may be the change needs to happen here this needs to be a comfortable community to raise your children in yes and absolutely the answer is not okay well i'm just going to send them to school and have them get up an hour and a half early to be able to travel on the train or bus. It's no, I'm going to put them into a school that stands by some of, um, stands by my vision of what I want to see for their education and where they fall short. Then I'll say, you know, I'm that active parent. I'm in the PTA. I chaperone school trips. I'm, I'm all over the place. And I, you know, just as much as my children find to be acceptable, because sometimes they'll say, mom, you know, you back up a mom. little bit, but um, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> just, but you know, as, as as much as they want me to be involved, I'm involved. You know, if they tell me, well, you know, if they're part of the entrepreneur club in their school, um, because my family is a long line of entrepreneurs. My mom owned a newsstand on Tremont, a few up where from where I opened my tax office. I um, say this we, all we've been the a time. In this community for forever. People tease me when I say this. My pop was the same way. We lived in the, we lived in the Bronx. He was a DJ, part time DJ in the seventies. Right, we had our own own little business. He was on the side. Right, we had turntables back then, and the, and the big reel to reels in the seventies. It was like Donna Summer. I know, terrible, but uh, yes, but the, that's what it was. Right, we had that stuff. Right, but we were doing. So I think the entrepreneurial spirit is 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 amazing, and I think we have crushed that in New York City. And I bring up on top with the licensing, right? The licensing to to do so many different things. Right, if you open up a tax office, you know. Being a CPA is expensive, right? Being a tax preparer, not so much, right? But still a little bit. Being registered, a little bit. But you see how it gets so much more expensive to be an entrepreneur, uh, to, to open up a hair salon. Oh, my God, it's $20,000 to get a license to open up a hair salon, to braid hair, right? It's a lot of money. And I've been saying that for so many, the, the answer for so many poor communities, particularly brown and black communities, is to is to is to make sure we keep that entrepreneurial spirit right to to lower some of the barriers to entry so that so that more people can get a piece of that the ownership mentality and god i see you have it completely you have that this is my community my business you have an ownership mentality i love it there are too many of us who don't have an ownership mentality we have a a rental mentality it's only about can i make next month and that's it. That's the only mindset too many of us have. We've got to have that ownership mindset that we own our jobs. 
we we own our, our our careers even right not everyone has to have a job obviously not everyone has to have a career not everyone has to have a business but whatever you have you own it it's yours and i love you actually own your community not enough people own that community thank you so also with the um with the build the bronx initiative the the reason why i started the nonprofit organization was because um basically I was raised to, to learn that, you know, well, being in business, um, one thing that I've, I've noticed is that, you know, there have been times where I've raised, I've raised someone to position of management, you know, let's say I bring someone on board and I hire them and they, um, they start out when I, when I was working in a furniture company, um, I, I've hired someone and I promoted them to the position of manager. And then um, they basically they would, they would be waiting for me to explain to the staff that, you know, this is the new manager and this is the person that you have to respect. But that type of power and that type of leadership does not come from me divesting that power into you. It comes from you being a go to person. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't just say, OK, well, yesterday I was a sales associate. Now, today I'm the manager. So I need you to respect me. That have, that that type of respect I have to find in you while you're a sales associate. I have to see that you're the type of person that the staff turns to when it's time for when they're struggling with something. Hey, how did you do this? Can you help me out with that? And then once I see that you're that type of person and you're that type of leader and you take that type of ownership, then you can be promoted to that role of manager. Management of leadership, and I and and that's how I choose to lead in the community as well. So with Build the Bronx, the purpose for creating is it was okay. Well, I don't need to actually be an elected official to make these changes Absolutely. in my community. The power comes from within me. I can advocate for the same type of change that I need to see in the community from now. And that is the purpose of me building these relationships with the elected officials in the community, with with the nonprofits, with being an active uh, part of my community board. So um, for this this uh, election cycle, I actually was on the ballot. Well, I, I, I believe I'm on the ballot for um, county committee member for the Bronx. Um, I am also awaiting my awaiting nomination for um, community board five to become a, a member of the community board. Um, I regularly not only attend the general the general body meetings, also to the committee meetings. Um, one of the issues that I tackled now is um, in my building, like go to person for every problem there is. I can't go on the elevator without someone telling me about their sink that stopped up and how I need to go and talk to management on their behalf. Right. So um, I was I was going around and I was carrying petitions uh, this past, ele past election cycle and some of the member some of the, the residents in the building said to me well unique well you know there's a there's a parking space that's be there's about four parking spaces on the block that's being there's a no parking sign there and residents have to move their car by seven a.m. For a bus stop, that's it's not a bus stop. It was a, a unloading zone for mm -hmm. children to go to a daycare that's now closed. Mm -hmm. The daycare has been closed for several months, and the residents of the building were still receiving parking tickets, and they were being told from the spot, even though the buses are no longer, the school buses are no longer going there, and the daycare is closed. So they said, "Well, Unique, well, what is but it, it was that we still can a do?" Profit by? center for the city, so we gotta get some tickets. Exactly. So it's like they're <laughs> yeah. like. Well, what are we going to do about this? And I'm like, okay, well, perfect timing because the community board meeting tonight, and it just so happens to be the municipal services meeting. So at the when it's the municipal services meeting, and I told them about the parking tickets, they said, okay, well, you know, Miss Smith, so if you can get everyone in the building who received the ticket in the past six months to give you a copy of their parking tickets, and you bring it into the meeting. Well, this was this was back in March, and we didn't anticipate everything mm -hmm. being shut down with COVID nineteen. But they were saying if you can get if you can get everyone to come into the meeting, that would be great. Otherwise, if you can just create a petition, have people sign it, and then give them a give you a copy of their parking tickets, mm -hmm. then we'll try and overturn the parking tickets if they were towed or booted. Nice. We'll try and reimburse them for that. Um, I still haven't seen the sign removed as of yet. Um, but again, the city has been focusing on a lot so bigger issues. And I can understand that, but but that's the type of solutions that I start working I, on. I love from that now. idea, uh, and it's, <laughs> so I mean, I love the concept of you getting people together and motivating them to act. I want to ask you a, a different question. You mentioned the idea that in your in your uh, building there's about three hundred some odd units. Yes, three eighty four. There we go. So it's a lot of units, big building, a lot of units. A lot of people who don't live in New York City can't even imagine that, right? It's mm -hmm. it's unimaginable for them. 
but I know that there, there's a lot, right? Um, I, I, I wanna, there's an idea that I brought up when I was running for governor, and I'd love to have your two cents on this. And it was the idea of helping people who are renters in general, those who are in government housing, those are, who are in low income housing, those in any type of housing, there's a lot of housing, giving people the opportunity, particularly for, for, for um, uh, government housing, giving people the opportunity to own the home. Hmm. Giving people the opportunity to say, look, you're you're in you're in government housing and you're always waiting for the government to fix it somehow. Right. And the government's constantly failing on fixing it again and again and again. The government had you know, there's too much lead. There's too much. This is how about we give you the opportunity to own it. And we do something like this. I'm making this up. But, you know, one third of, of how much money you make is what you got to pay to begin owning the house. And you can get in the deed and you'll start paying the mortgage until it's paid off. However long you've been in the apartment will count towards how much it costs or how much you've already paid. And over time, you can become an owner. And you could turn some of these uh, rentals, 384 rentals, which is very common, right, into co-ops or condos, giving people the idea of the, the idea of ownership. Particularly, and I bring this, this could be for any, the city could encourage this model for anyone who owns a building or any company who owns a building in any poor or non-wealthy neighborhood, right? If you own a building in a wealthy neighborhood, you don't care, you're happy. But if it's not a wealthy neighborhood, right? You're worried about, are, do I have section eight issues, right? Do I not have section eight issues? Do I have people inspecting, you have all these issues. What if I gave you as an owner an opportunity, you own a building, to have your people transfer over into them owning the entire building, you get to walk away with the cash. No more problems, no more slumlord, none of that. You get to walk away, right? And maybe if they're paying mortgage, you get to collect the mortgages like rents and you get to walk away. Life is good. You can go buy another building someplace else, giving ownership to the people there. Do you like that concept or no? I like that concept. Um, I believe that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, red tape to that goes behind it. I have and that's what I'm trying to get rid of. Exactly right. Yes. I've seen exactly something right. similar happen to a building of, that a friend of mine lives in. Uh, he lives in Washington Heights, and his building wound up. Um, I think they were they were changing from rental units to co-ops and condos, and they had to give a they had to give a um, they had to give the 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 residents of the building the first opportunity to to be able to say okay well this is what we're going to buy in at and it was a very it was a very reduced cost and he and his mother were able to to go ahead and purchase the units and you know it's it's been great but for a building that that's like mine that's uh that's regulated by HPD and yep. um and there I don't think that it's something that that would I would have to look into that and find mm -hmm. out you know if if there is a model that um that that would work for there is a model that happened in london okay. there's not an american model for this it's okay. only a london model so if you have a chance you want to look into that it's an interesting idea and again you find a lot of, if you have if you own a building in a rich neighborhood who cares they already bought they're already condos manhattan upper east side who cares i'm talking brooklyn queens bronx staten island people who have a, a rental mindset and are always waiting for HPD, come help us fix this damn thing. Instead, take some ownership. But it's optional, right? If you don't, look, maybe you're moving in the Bronx because you're from Yemen and you want to be there for a couple of years. You're going to move someplace else. You don't want to own. No worries. Pay your rent. And when you're done, you move to Jersey or whatever is your world. But maybe you care about the Bronx and you want to live here as your community. Maybe you want to have some ownership. and You get an opportunity to have some ownership. I, I think um, my I, I totally agree with that. Um, I didn't, my approach necessarily wasn't towards ownership. It was actually it. So one of the one of the um, issues that my nonprofit organization has taken on is voter education as well. So oh, sure. that, that goes into educating people because um, people don't. I can't say people, not everyone, but a lot of a lot of people don't understand the importance of grassroots organizations, grassroots movements, people don't understand the importance of a tenants association. Mm, so for, sure. example, um, for example, the tenants association in my building, um, we have, it, it's because of my tenants association that we receive so many resources from our elected officials. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a humongous building. So if you can provide resources in this building, 
you know, you're getting a lot of different families. Someone's going to pay attention to you, but you have to be organized. You have to have a point of a contact. You have to have an ask. You have to know what the problems are, and then you have to know what the solution is that you're seeking, and then you have to present those problems and the solutions in an organized manner to a point of contact. Now, my president, the president of my tennis association, Ms. Ms. Harges, I love her to death. She's also the vice president of the community council for the local police precinct, precinct 46, mm. 46 precinct. So we receive a lot of resources from our Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner, from our Councilwoman Vanessa L. Gibson. So because because we have that level of organization, they she she reaches out to everyone on a personal on a on a personal basis all the time to say, hey, listen, there are a lot of tenants in the building who are complaining because repairs are not being done. And guess what happens? The repairs get done because now you've got the assemblywoman and you've got the councilwoman behind your back yeah. as a as the management company. And then you know, for example, like my building manage, my building ownership is trying to, uh, they're getting ready to build another building right next door. And they have to go to the community board, which mm -hmm. although the community board are not paid members, they're not paid elected officials or anything like that, but they have a voice. Of they course. have to go, the, the building ownership ha just recently was on our last com uh, community board five meeting requesting to get a letter of recommendation to be able to build the building next door. And then guess what happens? People like me who are on the call and say, oh, wait a minute, you wanna build a building next door. What about the broken elevators that we have currently? And, and the fact that you're not responding to that swiftly enough before Community Board 5 can, gets the answer and give you that letter of recommendation, what are you gonna do for the residents that you currently have mm -hmm. and the buildings that you currently own? Are you meeting those obligations? And then and then once you can say, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll do that. We didn't know about the elevator issue. Management didn't pass that down to us. We didn't know that that needed to be taken care of expeditiously. Then, you know, that that's the key in being organized. It's mm -hmm. It's getting this the the information out to everyone that you know these grassroots movements, these these um, the community boards, the tenants associations, things like yeah. that. They do matter. You have to be you you just have to be involved. And, and once I think you if you have more people who have ownership, I think mm -hmm. more people tend to get involved. But if, if you look Absolutely. at the the gated communities that you find outside of the city, right? They're all owners. And they're all on the local board and they all care about this stuff because they care about their own gated community. They care. So Absolutely. they're on. I mean, maybe there's an idea where you could ask them and have the conversation to where you can even make almost like a, a, a two tier building. Right? If you go to some of the buildings in Manhattan, Upper East Side, the wealthy people, right? Very often the, the first three floors are commercial. Yes. And then everything above it, that's all residential. Yes. Right. So they generate revenue from the commercial at the bottom. Right. Maybe it's a storefront or something. And then it's maybe office buildings, offices. Right. In the next two. And then so the people up and there's two separate elevators, elevators for the, the business people. Right. And then there's the elevators for the people who have, you know, the million dollar, two million dollar, four million dollar apartment upstairs. Right. Those types. Maybe you could follow a similar model there, too, where you have maybe the bottom is commercial. Right, so that the people could have that daycare right there. They could have that, you know, bodega right there. They could have that supermarket right there. Then maybe some commercial where they could rent that out, right? And then maybe ownership. Absolutely. The next couple of floors are for owners. You could purchase those, and the next could be just rental. Ah, that is that. That would be that would be something great for me to tackle once I join the land use community. Absolutely. Uh, committee on the city council so yes and if that. you if you do commercial part you could even for example you could even uh do what rental space on the roof you know for uh for marketing right particularly yeah. with particularly with all of the uh particularly with all of the uh media that's getting shot in new york city now you know you get someone's name on top of a building that's in every other netflix movie okay. <laughs> right there's, there's some name on a building right and that right there that that I feel, and and maybe you you disagree. That I feel is how if you have commercial, meaning retail, then commercial, purchase, rental, marketing on top, you can create low income rentals without any sub without any subsidies. Because remember that budget is going to be going away. It's going to be going away after COVID. So we got to find a way to have low income rentals 
without having to rely on government subsidies. They're gonna, they're gonna go away. We're not gonna have them. Absolutely, I totally agree. I'm so definitely we're rocking and rolling. So we're almost at an hour. We kind of went off the off the farm here. Is there something you want to specifically bring up? You know, before we go any further, anything you want to bring up before we end this? Uh, yes, I would like to bring up the fact that uh, you know running a campaign is very very costly, um, and we are definitely we would definitely appreciate any donations to the campaign that you Absolutely. can. Absolutely. That your that your uh, community would be willing to donate. Um, our website is not fully launched at the moment. I do have a landing page. On the landing page, there is a contribute button. Um, so if you go to smithforcitycouncil.org, org, um, smithforcitycouncil org. There we go. Yeah, you can donate to the campaign um, and. Basically, you can sign up for you can sign up for an update for when the website actually goes live. Um, and I would just appreciate any form of support that uh, your community is willing to extend to our campaign and any volunteers as well. So anyone who feels that they are um, that they have they have been active in terms of in terms of criminal justice reform, for one, um, you know, to to. I, I like to be able to have um, someone who's kind of a liaison to be able to give me more background information on certain issues that are a part of my platform. And those issues, for example, are... Oh, we didn't even go down your seven issues. Look at that. We went talking. <laughs> go down your seven issues. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a bad host. I apologize. Please. No problem. We had an interesting conversation. So uh, within, uh, within Council District 16, we are the number three uh, council district for homelessness in the Bronx. We have the... Um, we have a, a ton of homelessness in the Bronx. So anyone who feels that they're well versed in homelessness or uh, criminal justice reform, um, affordable housing, uh, education and equality, mental health services, and food insecurity, or and and or voter education, we would greatly appreciate more volunteers for our campaign. Volunteers and fundraising are. Uh, our, our, our primary focus right now outside of just getting out the donations of the PPEs and um, and, and just trying to be an asset to the community that way. So as, so as many, I, I would appreciate as many volunteers as I possibly can to help out with the campaign, especially by way of research and um, partnering up with different nonprofit organizations. I know that as a 501c3, there is very little that the, uh, that you know, nonprofit organizations can do towards helping with the campaign because, you know, there are legal mm -hmm. ramifications towards that, you know, through the IRS, they can't be involved actively. There's, also, in there's always build the Bronx. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> I'm not asking that any nonprofit organizations take part in the campaign, but just give me your feedback. Let me know where, you know, um, where some of the, the, the pitfalls are, what some of the shortcomings are, um, what services you feel that, uh, that the community still needs, how we can be an asset uh, to the community, what it is that you would like to see city council members um, help out with a little bit more. And, and that way, you know, I can I can try and make that a part of my platform and just be an asset as, in, in any way that I can possibly be. So smithforcitycouncil.org. There we go, smithforcitycouncil.org. Uniqua, thank you so much for this evening. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Uh, it was amazing, I'm glad you came. I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Have All a right. great day.